Welcome back to a very British space program as we fire off some engines. In today's episode, we're going to be visiting Venus, but first, we're going to launch something new from Spirit Adam. Let's get going. Well, it is the 25th of October 1962, and this is the Blue Squire. It's quite simply half of a blue knight. Yeah, we, we basically we, we cut one in half. I mean, we didn't actually cut one in half, because if you cut one in half, you know, it would have... Anyway, you get the idea. It's basically half the, the launch capability, half the engines, and we just refined it a little bit just to make it nice. So it's, this should be capable of placing about sort of five tons into low Earth orbit. And uh, we're going to actually use this craft to continue to improve our near-Earth communication system uh, by putting up a geostationary constellation. But we're going to do it step by step. We're going to do it one by one. So this is our first geocom craft, and uh, it's uh, it's the first of hopefully four. And we might put some other stuff up as well as we advance. Uh, we're launching from Spade Adam. Um, because our building facilities in Australia are just backlogged at the moment, we've got a lot of interplanetary stuff going on. Um, so Spade Adam is doing our manned craft. It's also doing our, um, oh, yeah, and subscribe. It's also doing our, um, our sort of <clears throat> unmanned sort of work as well for, for around Earth. So, so it's going to be doing all this sort of stuff. But that does mean that we actually have um, a problem, which is that we're at a bit of a high inclination. So this craft has got a transfer stage that is a single section of the, the Hesperus Earth departure stage that you actually saw in the last episode. Um, I think it was the last episode. So it's actually got the Hesperus actually has a two tanked system, one on top of the other. This is using a single tank design for it. And you can see we're actually we've we've gone into orbit and we're actually going to use that tank to take us out onto our geostationary transfer orbit. So we're waiting until we're at our um ascending or descending node. Um and we're actually going to do the transfer at that point. That means that our our node for ascending and descending will be at the apoapse and periapse of, of our future orbit. Um, and you see as they're firing the engine, which means that we can actually, when we get out as far away as we are going to from the from the Earth, we can actually do our circularization and an inclination change at the same time, which should save us a significant amount of energy. Because if you look at this now, we actually look as though we were downing, we're, we're, we're flying sort of slightly downwards, um, partly because we had extra energy in that stage that we just wanted to use up. So we, we did a bit of an inclination change there, not very effective, but we used any excess fuel up that we had. So... <clears throat> now we're just trying to identify where that ink that the ascending and descending node is and i actually use the maneuver planner which i don't normally use but just to basically identify where that ascending and descending node are going to be because zooming in on the map a little bit difficult at times so you see there i've actually got the 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 node placed for me and then i'm just going to do them the actual calculation and the, the rearrangement myself and all i'm doing here is playing around with prograde retrograde and normal anti-normal burn because if I just do a prograde burn from that position, I'll actually maintain my inclination. If I do just an inclination change there, I change a bit of my prograde and my prograde, or I change my my uh, periaps at that point as well. So I've got to balance them a little bit. I've got to increase the speed of my orbit, but in the right direction, okay? And I might do a video in the future about this because it's actually quite interesting. So we get out as far as we can and we just do the burn. You can see the craft here. It's got a number of communication dishes on the top there. One will be facing uh, Earth, one will be facing the Moon, and the other two will basically be designed for redundancy for either another member of the system or for any craft that are interacting or if I want to put a bit of data system. So we've got four of these little antenna in there at the moment, and they should give us the range to the Earth and to the Moon. And there you go, we've, we've done our burn, we've positioned ourselves reasonably okay. Now this is not going to be its final orbit, you'll see it's not actually in geostationary, it's got restartable engines. It's got a little bit of fuel in there, which is going to be enough. But this is sort of a parking orbit that it's going to stay in for a little while while we get the rest of the system up. Because I haven't decided where I want these, how I want them arranged, if there is going to be four, if there's going to be more. So it can do its job a bit as it is, but it's not going to be located specifically in one place. Now the other thing we've decided is we're actually going to get rid of the Newton test craft as well, which is, you know, uh, I'm not going to show you us doing that, but that will be happening. Um, so on to our next one, I think. Right. It's the 27th of October 1962 and before we get to our first arrival at Venus we have a few weeks to wait and so the, the Spear, Spear Adam team have actually dusted off a, a Princess, uh, a Red Princess 5A which was built 
not just before the Geo Constellation mission you just saw, but actually before the White Javelin 3 missions from the last episode. It's actually been sat waiting around for the right mission. So this is the uh, the Red Princess 5A again. We've launched a couple of these now, and we're just sort of refining this craft. Um, I don't know how much of a future it actually has, because it has a lot of engines on the first stage, and they're not actually that expensive. But we're actually getting to the point now where we're getting some bet better, bigger engines, and while I quite like the redundancy of multiple engines like this, because, you know, if one of them goes, you still got thrust from the others, as long as it's not in the first sort of 10 seconds of launch, you're actually still potentially going to make it to orbit, whereas big engines, one goes, you lose the whole craft potentially. So I don't know. I think we're going to we're going to do clustering quite a lot on, on this set of missions. So so the idea for this craft is it's going to go up into a an orbit and this is a commercial communications contract you could have seen it at the start there it's going to go up to an orbit that's about a thousand kilometers by about five thousand kilometers with an inclination of over 31 degrees so from speed adam is fine for that inclination should be easy and then we just got to work out the periaps and the and the apple apps. i could have actually probably done this with a uh, red princess 4c um mm, it would have been tight because this is actually quite a heavy payload but we had one of these sitting around, so I thought, well, let's just reuse it for that. Um, it's hoped that we can actually increase our VAB capacity quite shortly because progress at the UK and Australian sites are, are pretty limited at the moment. There is a backlog of mission material, particularly with the, the manned versus unmanned missions at the moment. We're, we're actually fighting for space. Um, we're hoping in the fa in the future to bring up another line of manned craft, shall we say? It's going to be quite different. We've got the the team from Avro Canada working on it, and and that's going to take us some time. But they're designed to be a bit quicker turnaround, a bit quicker actually in getting going. And there you can see it going into orbit. And you can actually see our communication system is actually starting to work quite nicely. It's starting to actually improve the communications around the stuff. So there we go. Missions a good one. Money's ours. Thank you very much. We just do that. So. Right, I'm gonna get to the I'm gonna get to the, the Venus mission very soon, but just before just before we start that, it is the 17th of November 1962. Um, as news arrives that the USSR's Mars One mission has lost contact approaching the red planet. What a pity. <laughs> oh, we should really apologize. Well, not apologize, we should really send them our condolences. I mean we've had problems with Mars ourselves. Um anyway, we're launching the Hesperus 2 series. Yeah, that's right, Hesperus to Ceres, that, that works for us, doesn't it, as a name? Um, and it's going to do a, a fly past. It's it's uh, the largest body in the asteroid belt. It was found uh, quite a while ago, actually. It was um, discovered by Giuseppe Piazzi, if I remember rightly, um, in about, in, I think it was January 1800, 1801, something like that. Uh, it was originally going to be considered a planet, a bit like Pluto is was at this time is a planet. Obviously, in the future, it may not be a planet. Um, uh, but was actually reclassified as an asteroid i think about 50 years after it was uh, discovered um because there was other objects in similar orbits um which we'll come on to in a minute so this craft's actually going to stay in orbit for a while you can see that it is basically the 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 hesperus 2 is the hesperus but with bigger solar panels because it's going further out and uh and a sort of slightly, we've added another sort of section to that that transfer stage. This transfer stage got a bigger lump on it. So that's the Hesperus 2, just a modification of the Hesperus 1 that you've already seen. So with that, hmm, I wonder what could happen next. Oh, let's think, it's the 17th of November, what's next? Oh, oh, here we are, nice transition there to the 21st of November, 1962. Uh, November's a busy time for us, so we've got the Hesperus 1b, and it is entering the, the Venus sphere of influence. Uh, and this is where the fun really be begins, because the Hesperus 1b is the one that travelled there the fastest. It travelled there the short route. It set off going as quickly as it could, and so we don't think it's actually going to have the fuel to get into orbit. We think it's, it's touch and go. Um, so we've actually we've actually positioned it so that it's going to hit the atmosphere a little bit, just a little bit of air, air breaking. Well, we don't know if it's air, um, gas breaking, particulate breaking. It's definitely not litho breaking. We know that. A little bit of um, uh, cushioning, atmospheric cushioning. There we go. Atmospheric cushioning. It's having some atmospheric cushioning as it fires its row engine, and we're actually worried about this because the row engines have not been particularly reliable since we actually started using them, but this one seems to have done okay, and you can see we're going burn and burn and burn, we're, we're using all the fuel, and I think we finish with uh, literally a, a thimble full, a thimble full of fuel. We've got the fuel that's literally in this ignition system, so we don't think we can actually fire the uh, the main thrusters anymore. We use our RCS just at the end there, just to bring us in. You can see we've just about 
with a little bit of RCS, just a little bit of RCS, just the tiniest little bit that we've got, we're going to try and hopefully get into some sort of orbit. Now, you can see we're getting close. We're getting, there we go, right. We're just in orbit. But our, our, our periapsis is now in the atmosphere. So we're going to have, we haven't got a signal at the moment. So what we're going to actually have is as soon as we come into a position where we get signal, we're going to put up a maneuver node and we're going to try when we get to our apoaps to just pump our our periaps out of the atmosphere. We this is just this is just doing science. It's just doing near near equatorial science. This is our you know in case of backup craft. We know we knew it was going to be tight. So this one just made it wonderful. Right. Well, that that's nice. But you know what else we got? Well, we've got. On the 24th of November, 1962, so three days later, we have Hesperus 1A arrive in the uh, Venus Sphere of Influence. And first, what we're going to do here is this one's got a lot more fuel on board. It's also got a slower speed approaching. It's a much more sort of viable candidate for, for using for science. But our, our other one was there to get first because remember, we were actually worried about being beaten by the Russians and people like that to this orbit around Venus. So we were, we were pushing that one as quickly as possible. So... This craft is going to go in and we're going to try and put it on inclination about 90 degrees. So we've repositioned ourselves to go over the pole and then we're having a look at how can we draw down our our, apo, our periaps. Just we know from the first craft we can just skim that atmosphere just a little bit and it just gives us every little tiny bit of delta V that we can get out of this process is vital right now. Because again this craft has the delta V to get into orbit but We'd like to be able to maneuver it a little bit while we do. So we're going to put it just to, to, to skim the atmosphere, give us a little bit of delta V back as it were, so we can uh, we can be safe a bit. And the idea with this one is that what we'd really like is, if we can get it into orbit, is to keep it going through just the, the upper atmosphere every now and again, so that we can bring down our apoaps into a more circular orbit before we start using all of its fuel to do other things. So you see here, we're just recentering itself. It's doing a little bit of inclination change there. Tiny little burn nice and easy using RCS. Wonderful. So now we have to come along and hope and hope and hope um, that we can actually uh, get this thing into orbit. So we're going to accelerate towards it nice and quick, get everything ready. You can see I'm actually, I was actually quite nervous at doing this because uh, I, I foresaw a problem. I've put a marker in there so we know roughly how much delta V we're going to need. Uh, we know we've got more delta V than required there, but it's about being as efficient as possible so we're about to start hitting atmospheric interface any second we're going to start to feel that little pull just now we're, we're still going to be accelerating because we're still going down at that point but you see we're in the atmosphere just a little bit and we're going to fire our engines and we're just skimming that atmosphere and that atmosphere is just giving us a little extra bit of push it's really going to help us a little bit so there we go firing the engines you can see we've still quite a lot of fuel lots of delta v available for us to do that circular agitation and everything we're going to keep one part of our our orbit down low um, we're going to keep it in this sort of position we're going to try and just maintain that that orbit in the upper atmosphere just to bring that periaps down over time the apoaps down over time and um, i'm actually not going to show you how many cycles this goes through but what i actually do is i uh, i place a maneuver node pretty much just before atmospheric interface and we put it in the in the uh, in the alarm clock and uh, in amongst other missions i will actually jump back watch this go through the atmosphere come up and then I'll put another maneuver at peri uh, at apoaps and then we'll just reposition it so there we are it's just sailing off now away from venus and uh, yeah it's going to it's going to be it's going to be hopefully the one that gives us most of the science because it's going to get the all of the different biomes because it's in that polar orbit so while that's sailing away from venus as far as it can get from venus we have on the 3rd of December 1962, Hesperus 1b, it's gone right out away from Venus and it's going to start coming back. And it's just now doing a little tiny bit of RCS burn, just as you can see there to pull itself out of the atmosphere. So it is in orbit. It's going to stay in orbit in this really eccentric orbit around Venus, getting us science and things like that. Hopefully it'll give us a bit of a relay capability. So back around the Earth, however, it's time for the departure of the Ceres craft. So this is Hesperus 2 Ceres. So this is the 10th of December um, and it's uh, it's got an extended departure stage compared to the previous Hesperus craft. And I've, I've said that before, it's literally got an extra tank. So whereas our geostationary craft that had that 
one tank. The Hesperus one had two tanks. This has got three tanks. It might actually have four, but anyway, it's got extra tanks in there. We've got extra solar panels on the upper stage there on the actual on the actual Hesperus two to give it the extra energy, the extra electricity it needs. We're going to fire the row engine, and the row engine there is literally just finishing off um, the burn. There's a lot of um, energy being, so we say, released in Earth orbit right now to do this. We've still got a lot of energy in the tanks. We don't think, we don't think that we can actually circularize. In fact, we're pretty sure we can't. The interesting thing is you can see there that on our way out of the, out of the Earth system, we actually have to go past the moon. Um, and we're a little concerned that that's gonna be a problem for us. Um, but we'll see what happens. Um, it's gonna have a quick fly past the moon into its sphere of influence, and then we're gonna do some refinement there. As we prepare for this though, we hear that the USS Air has its Mariner 2 craft entering the sphere of influence of Venus. So Torx turned to orientating the cameras on our, our Hesperus craft so we can take some pictures of it, uh, which we thought was nice, but unfortunately, you know, we can't really afford the fuel. Anyway, 12th of December 1962 what are we launching now we've done we've done Ceres we've we've got Venus going on well well we've got we've got Hesperus 2 Ceres well we're going to send Hesperus 2 Vesta as well this is another another small planetary type body asteroid type body and this is again in that sort of same sort of region of space as Ceres it's uh, it's slightly further out if I remember rightly um, and we're just going to send the same craft. So this is pretty much our Hesperus 2 again. Same transfer stages and everything. We know it's got pretty much the Delta V to do everything we need it to do. Um, and so we're just going to send it up there. And it launches really nicely. You can see there, this is, you know, this is actually was our backup craft for the Ceres mission. And um, the decision was made that if the first craft managed to get into its sort of departure stage burn and it was departing, if it made that and there was no problems, then we would launch this to Vesta. So we were actually re reusing. We're not always going to send two craft to everything. We're, we're reusing some of our backup craft here. And this it seems like something that a lot of space agencies are planning to do. So there we go into orbit, position the craft, and uh, it's going to uh, it's going to position itself on the normal inclination and just sit in orbit for a little while because of course it's now a little early. It was it was basically going to be the backup for the Ceres mission. So it was on the pad waiting just in case, but we can actually wait a little while now for this craft to depart. So while it positions itself, while we start to think about, well, what's the next step? And while we prepare to celebrate the end of 1962 as a year that we've done quite staggering work in actually, you know, we've spent, sent humans up into space, we've space walked, we've gone to other planets, we've orbited other planets. Until next time, have a great one.